Yeah, so my name's Eric Dahlstrom with Space Base, and uh, uh, my background is I uh, started in astronomy and then went to uh, into space engineering, uh, working for NASA in the U.S. and then uh, been here in in New Zealand for about three years. Uh, and space, we're in a space base. We're trying to uh, help uh, develop the New Zealand space industry in a variety of different ways. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, I'll, uh, zoom through a lot of information here on Starlink and uh, mega constellations, and just to give you some technical background on the on these systems. Uh, here, there's an image from uh, one of the Starlink passes. Uh, uh, recorded in the Netherlands. Um, uh, now, why? Okay, here we go. Yeah, so uh, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the motivation for why the Starlink constellation is being built about the space based internet and uh, uh, and all the way down to the user terminals and then talking about the astronomy impact. Um, so, one aspect of this is trying to expand high speed internet access around the world. And this is sort of the snapshot of the current state with uh, in New Zealand, uh, where we have about 34% to the population with access to faster than 0.2 megabits per second. And the world is about 14%. And uh, almost everything that we're doing is going through these, a few fiber connections. Um, this uh, Zoom call right now is going through this fiber up here on the way to California. And uh, uh, and so uh, the, the landlines uh, connecting to the fiber is the main access for internet right now. Um, our our uh, space-based internet systems uh, in geosynchronous orbit, um, here's geosatellites way out here at the scale. Um, they're, uh, uh, or the orbits to scale, and they, um, right now you can get uh, geo inter space based internet from uh, three providers in New Zealand, uh, roughly about $200 a month, um, and with an installation cost of about $500 to $2,000 uh, to install one of these dishes. And the main uh, problem with geo space based internet is the half second uh, time lag. So it would be virtually impossible to have a Zoom conversation uh, or you would strongly notice the time lag if you were trying to do this through a, a, a geo satellite connection. And also, uh, even $200 a month is only for these concentrated areas that the spot beams uh, cover uh, for the developed world. Um, when uh, my wife was in uh, volunteering at a, at a uh, refugee camp in Lebanon, I tried to look into providing her internet access and it was $10,000 a month for, uh, for a dish there. Uh, now, if you can uh, go through a low earth orbit satellite very close to the earth, um, the problem with the low earth orbit satellites is that they only spend about eight minutes over the horizon. So you have to have a whole constellation if you're gonna provide continuous internet links. And there's a difference between uh, bouncing it off of one satellite and then back down to the ground and then using fiber connections versus uh, bouncing it up to a satellite and having the satellites talk to each other and then go back down to the ground. Um, so that's inner satellite links is the ultimate goal of these constellations, but there are no uh, inner satellite links yet. And so the current SpaceX Starlink satellites do not have internet inner satellite com links. They bounce back and forth to a local ground station. Um, their, uh, their plan system is going to try to be faster than uh, fiber on the ground by going through space and communicating through inter-satellite links like uh, LaserCom. So this is, uh, these are, for example, the ground stations in the US that they're testing with their beta system. And uh, so the Starlink system would only work well for these regions of the US um, in the current configuration. Um, if you wanted to have this in New Zealand, you would have to have approval from the New Zealand government to install a ground station in New Zealand to 
uh, for our user terminals to be able to relay back to the uh, ground station in New Zealand and then connect to fiber or whatever. Um, so in the people have started to see sort of leak these photos of of what Starlink uh, looks like. Uh, these are their their little user terminals here and these are the big ground stations here. So the the current state of of uh, Starlink is they have 540 satellites on orbit right now. They have a FCC approval of 12,000 satellites and um, just a few months back they requested, well actually I'm, I made a typo here, they requested another 30,000 from the US uh, Federal Communications Commission. Uh, now the, the finances and uh, about these constellations is that, I mean, one comment I've heard is, you know, is it all for the US government and military? And, and it's not, uh, not so far um, because the military has done a small scale test of whether or not they can use the Starlink, but they have said that they're not interested in Starlink if it's only, you know, uh, if there's no inner satellite links. You, because every place you you can only operate from where you have ground stations nearby. Um, the uh, there's a link down here to an article about their test with the military. Um, the main uh, motivation is is a low latency uh, to beat the speed of of fiber optic connections, and there's a strong motivation in for financial traders to to beat even you know by millise uh, milliseconds the uh, speed of so they can uh, have these rapid trading systems uh, to the markets and uh, and so that's a well, that's one where people are paying a lot of money to try to get those high speeds now uh, the the trade-off uh, I mean the the sort of uh, benefit in general is for uh, remote users anywhere, if you have the full, you know, inner satellite links, to be able to get and to share these one gigabit per second connections with Wi-Fi into, uh, you know, like a one satellite for a village or something, or for a neighborhood or something like that. Uh, when you, with these satellites, when they're launched, uh, the current Starlink design is is uh, optimized to launch as a, like a stack of cards on a Falcon 9. And so these are about 200 kilogram satellites uh, that, that are launched in a stack, uh, deployed, uh, and then you can see them, uh, an image of them being deployed like a stack of cards. And then they, they spend about a month uh, raising their orbit with a low thrust electron uh, um, ion drive, uh, going from 320 kilometers altitude to 550 kilometers altitude. Uh, you see them in the sky when the satellite is illuminated by the sun and you're in shadow. And so either in the evening or in the morning uh, at different parts of their orbit, you can see these uh, satellites uh, when they're still illuminated in the, by the sunlight. And this shows uh, that when they're, these satellites are raising the orbit, they have their array, array flattened out and when they are on station, they have their array uh, vertical, which so they look like a they, they, the shark fin come is their operational uh, attitude. And but when they're uh, spending a month climbing in orbit, they uh, they look like this open book configuration. Uh, I encourage you to try you know taking a look at the the satellites uh, both both the ones that are climbing to orbit and the ones that are up at uh, operational orbits. Um, this is uh, two sites that you can use, like Heavens Above is a good one for, for giving you a prediction of uh, specific minutes of when a sat satellite is gonna go overhead and, and some, some prediction about the, the brightness and stellar magnitudes. Um, and this uh, and the select track has a, has a illust uh, animation of where all the satellites are right now. Um, this is the current, this is at the moment I'm talking, this is where the satellites are. There happen to be a, a pass of some Starlink uh, satellites going over us right now. Um, this is what we know about user terminals so far. They're, it's just leaking out because they're in beta test. Um, 
Elon calls these things UFOs on a stick. And it's a, basically a, a phased array to track the satellite as it moves across the sky. Um, and this is a critical part of whether or not the system will work or be, uh, uh, make a business case. Um, people think that, you know, current systems that you buy off the shelf uh, price this um, phased array at $1,500. Uh, Star, uh, SpaceX is trying to get it to down to the, lower the manufacturing cost to about $200. Um, and they're, they're in beta test. This is a snapshot of someone's phone connected to a Starlink uh, Wi-Fi base station uh, of a gigabits per second to about 0 0.03 seconds latency instead of half a second. Um, the, the big issue for one of the big motivations pushing things for a rapid deployment is, um, is in two weeks, uh, the FCC will decide whether or not Starlink qualifies for a $16 billion subsidy in the, for the US for, uh, for rural um, broadband access. So now about what these things look like in the sky. Um, if, they're, if the satellites are on orbit in, in operational orbits at 550 kilometer orbits, they're really uh, mostly down at five or six uh, magnitude, right at the edge of visibility, faint stars. Sometimes they're observed as brighter, and it's it's kind of interesting to you know say that some satellites appear uh, brighter among the uh, among the group, and it, I don't know if it's just the orientation or or what. Um, uh, and but during the orbit raising, when you you uh, have just after launch and for about three weeks to a month, uh, they will be climbing in the sky, and those can be very bright, magnitude two or or brighter. Now, uh, plot uh, they're they're actually uh, the proposed uh, mega constellations not only include Starlink, but also uh, OneWeb. Um, uh, the Amazon's uh, Kuiper, uh, there's Chinese uh, and Indian constellations. Uh, it's all these things have, you know, different numbers of satellites they're proposing to fly. And uh, so uh, with with the lower altitude, like in, in uh, 550 kilometers, like uh, Star, uh, SpaceX Starlink, um, they're, they're very bright right after sunset. And um, and then uh, in in twilight, they uh, they can be very bright. Uh, but the OneWeb satellites um, are at a high altitude, uh, 1,200 kilometers, and they can be up there way into um, into deep into the night. And uh, even though they might be only tenth magnitude, uh, very dim, uh, they can really cause a problem for uh, uh, astronomical observatories. So we're benefiting from um, just in the past few weeks uh, some uh, different uh, uh, workshops from astronomers uh, going on, uh, talking about uh, their analysis of these different uh, impacts for uh, t on telescopes, uh, and uh, some of this stuff you can find just with the hashtags on Twitter. You know, if you look for Satcom one. Any comments there? You'd, you'd see discussions with the SpaceX engineers about trying to get di uh, their satellites dimmer. Um, OneWeb is is a bizarre case right now. Uh, it's uh, it was planned for satellites at a 1,200 kilometer altitude, and they've launched 74. Then they filed for bankruptcy in March 2020. But it didn't mean the company went away. It just meant they they. They said declared that they didn't want to pay uh, Airbus three hundred and fifty million dollars for one thing. Um, then they have a even while they were in in bankruptcy, they revised their FCC ruling and asked for forty eight thousand satellite group, um, access. And now, just a couple of days ago, their assets were purchased for about a billion dollars by the U.S. government and this Indian company. Um, and so nobody knows exactly what's going on with this. Um, uh, one web thing and it's you know maybe there's a chance to, to influence what they're doing and and anything like that but it's very confusing um, the uh, SpaceX has been doing experiments to reduce the brightness of their satellites they they launched one 
uh, dark sat by painting their arrays, uh, their antennas. They said they had thermal problems with that, even if it got dimmer, dimmer. They have visor sat with these little plates that come out to try to shade the satellite. Um, and that uh, looks a little better and uh, more improved. Um, then, uh, and here's the, uh, an astronomer at the uh, uh, Large Synoptic Space Telescope, I mean, uh, uh, Survey Telescope, uh, which is now called the Rubin Observatory. Uh, and her measurements say that dark set was at sixth magnitude, but they really need to go farther and, and working with SpaceX to try to get them down to the seventh magnitude. Uh, and then also what they're gonna do with uh, trying to deal with this at the observatory. Um, one thing that they really need is a full bi-direct distribution function, which is basically uh, the brightness of an object with all combinations of sun angle and visible angle. And uh, this is an illustration of a uh, modeling that's being done by uh, Mariba uh, 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 Ja at, uh, in Texas. And uh, he's working with to try to get a, a develop a model that can predict accurately what the Starlink uh, satellites look like uh, from any angle, any illumination. And they're working now with SpaceX, but SpaceX, it's under non-disclosure agreement um, because SpaceX doesn't want competitors to know exactly what their satellite looks like from all directions. But it, it does seem like a, a appropriate thing to, to be working on. Um, and then the, uh, the models for, uh, this is for all objects, including all space debris, and this is the SpaceX uh, Starlink component, and this is only for right now, uh, and, and illustrating uh, parts of the survey sky for LSST uh, and what kind of problems they would uh, run into if they're conducting their surveys right now. Uh, and this is my, my joke about what else astronomers can do for fighting the Starlink satellites, use, use their lasers. But, uh, the, there's a little note here that um, in the US Congress on the, for the US FCC, they're asking for FCC to include, go back and include environmental impacts as well as the, um, uh, the communication, radio frequency communication problems in that. And, uh, and I guess uh, I, I made this chart about just the overall space law context with the different organizations, but I'll let, uh, uh, Maria, uh, talk about this. Uh, let me go ahead and, and stop sharing here. All right, I think that's all I had. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. That was very interesting. Um, and are there any uh, quick questions for Eric or? Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I did talk really fast. <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, I, I was very impressed. So the one thing that is, I forgot to mention is that um, the FCC has some strange incentives built in so that um, uh, it's, there's almost uh, like, People, you know, when they put in a request for a number of satellites at a certain frequency, um, they're basically asking the, the government to transfer value over to them. And suddenly it's, it's like, so they, there's really very little incentive to, to not ask for way more than you need. Um, the, the other side is that the FCC introduced these rules that said that after you get your approvals to, for your frequency use, you have to start using that within a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And so they put a, they, they sort of rushed people to start launching things even before they had everything fully set, uh, figured out. And that's, that I think is why, for example, I think SpaceX has went ahead and started deploying their satellites, even though they, they had planned for inter-satellite links, but they just, they decided not to do it on the first batch. So, so it, there's some peculiar incentives in this system. 
and also the the FCC is just only the U.S. you know uh, regulatory agency dealing with the sending information over to the International Telecommunications Union, um, and so it's uh, how much uh, people from other countries can influence is, is an open question. Um, well, um, if there are no questions for Eric, um, uh, Dr. Poza, would you like to begin your presentation? Um, uh, if you have covered, um, sorry, if you have covered everything that you would like to present at this point, Eric. Um, well, um, uh, please let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Maria Poza. She is the Principal Director of Gravity Law and um, within uh, her law practice she specializes in space law and that's all she, she wanted me to say about her so I'll let um, uh, Dr. Poza continue on with what you would like to present. Thank you. Hi, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Megan, for that introduction. Very grateful to you. And thank you so much, NZSSA, for the invitation to come and chat with you guys today at this presentation. You know, I'm always so impressed by people that give up their time, especially free time on a Sunday afternoon to come and listen to something that can be quite technical, but is really, really important to us all. So again, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Now, bear with me, I am still a Zoom newbie, but I'm going to try and share my page. I know you're all very excited about this and trust me, I'm really excited about getting it right. So here we go. And now I'm gonna put it into presentation mode. I think I'm winning. Right, and I think, can you guys see this? Um, can you see me moving that around? Right, I'm going to hide that. And I, uh, there we go. So let's hide the video panel. Right, there we go. So Megan, can you just confirm that you can see my full screen? Yes, it's all perfect. Lovely, and can you see me? Yes. Excellent, so I know not to pull any faces then because I can't see you. So. First of all, then, something that we're going to be looking at today is space law and policy. And I'm just going to be giving you a flavor or an overview, if you like, of some of the critical things that I deal with as part of Gravity Lawyers, which is my law firm. Um, I should probably very quickly give you a background. Gravity Lawyers deals with corporate commercial law, general corporate commercial law as well, in that respect. So. Lots of fun things, setting up companies and shareholders agreements and all of the things that make companies work. But we offer specialist services in space law as well as cyber, IT, aviation and general technology. OK, so for our presentation, we're going to be looking at just an overview then of the elements of space law and policy. Something that I'm always minded about with these presentations is who exactly are my audience? Could I be a pest? I'm not sure how we can do it. And I think you can do it with raise your hands with the interaction of Zoom. But could I have a show of hands of people who are undertaking some sort of social science science degree at Canterbury? And Megan, are you able to see how many hands have been raised? Uh, sure thing, I can do a count. So if everyone wants to do it now, and then Megan can give me a count. Do you have any numbers, Megan? I was muted. Uh, I saw three people. Three, okay, blimey. And do we have any law politics people in the audience? If you could raise your hands now, that would be great. Megan, uh, no one. There no is one. A, unfortunately. Well, lie me. Right. So a bunch of scientists then today. Okay. Well, I'll be very careful then to explain my terms as I go ahead. Sometimes a lot of people think law and policy, it's a little bit on the dry side. Actually, it's not. It's really fundamentally critical in order to get these applications working. So 
Starlink, for example, needed to have a really good process in place in order to navigate its way through national, um, as in domestic, as well as international law and policy in order to launch and then put up into the orbit Starlink. And that's much the same with any launch provider. So it's quite an important aspect, but as I say, we'll try and make it a bit exciting for a Saturday afternoon. All right, I am going to flick through. Now look, I am terribly sorry, but as any good lawyer, we've got a disclaimer. And we're going to go through it together just to make sure we all understand. So the material contained in this presentation is necessarily in summary form. It's not intended to be a comprehensive statement of the law as it applies to space or any other law for that matter. So accordingly, you must not rely on this material without first seeking legal advice and or permission from the author, i.e. if you're going to be launching something into space, please contact me, don't rely on the information from this presentation. Please don't plagiarize the material. Please do not use my intellectual property without my permission. And if there's any media in the audience, I didn't ask for a show of hands, but if you're there, come and see me after the presentation, I'll give you a quote. All right, so what are we gonna be looking at? I can hear all of your minds ticking along. First of all, I've got to turn you into international lawyers. From there, I've got to turn you into international space lawyers. So no mean feat by any stretch of the imagination and within just over 15 minutes. So in order to do that, I need to take you through international space law treaties, especially those treaties that pertain to activities in outer space. What do they mean? Why is it an international level and why do you need to know it? All fundamental questions. Then we're going to be having a look at the domestic frameworks. So how does international law trickle into domestic settings? For example, New Zealand. How does New Zealand reflect its international legal obligations in its domestic legal and policy framework? So we're going to be having a look at New Zealand's national law and New Zealand's policy framework. I can tell you're all very excited by this, so I'm going to go through now to international law. So, international law and your laws, what international laws 101 on how to become an international lawyer, not space lawyer yet, just a lawyer. First, we need to think about then what is international law? We don't have any lawyers in the audience. So, that makes my task a little bit easier because I can use some very, very, very basic terminology and examples and not get scolded for it afterwards. Okay, if you think of international law as something that works horizontally, and by horizontally, I'm talking about, think of something that is just a plain stretch. There's only one layer, one layer and it's horizontal. It's a line that goes straight across. States, or if you like nation states, or even better if you like countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, just any country in the whole world, and I'll refer to them as states, they adhere to international law at that horizontal level. The idea is that nation states, states, all countries have equal standing against each other. So New Zealand, the idea is, is just as equal as Australia on the international stage. Australia is just as equal as the US. All countries are equal to each other. And what we have are many international institutions like the UN, where these countries get together, they debate issues, they talk about things all together on an equal footing, because it's flat, it's horizontal, there's one line. It's not necessarily hierarchical, it's just that one line. Now, International law then also works on that one line. So that means that states choose to adhere to international law. They'll get together, probably at the UN or one of the many other organisations, and you would have seen some of those organisations on, on Eric's last PowerPoint slide, but they'll get together, they'll formulate international law, and then they'll circulate it to other nation states' diplomats. Diplomats will send it back to their countries, what do you think of this? Their lawyers in various governments will have a look through, give the yay or nay, maybe some amendments, it goes back, it's negotiated, and it's a little bit of a process. But the idea is, is that once international law has been agreed by all countries or nation states or states, they all sign the document, it comes into force at a certain day, and it applies to all nations in the way 
that they have signed it. So usually you have a signatory, you sign the document, and if you really want to show that you have enshrined that international law within your state, you will ratify it. And by doing that, you trickle it down, you pull down those elements into your national law. We'll get to that in a minute though, I promise. So international law then, it's horizontal in nature. It applies to everyone in the same way. And because it applies to everyone in the same way, and because states are neither above it nor below it, they are also on this same line. The idea is that states choose to adhere to their international legal obligations. So let's think about this just for a moment. If you have a state that does something a little bit naughty and it's not quite in keeping with their international legal obligations, perhaps they've signed a treaty or a document and they have signed up to something and they've done something that um, is not in line with that international law, there isn't an international police force that will come in to that state and lock up the citizens or lock up the state. There's nothing really of that nature available and that goes back to that flat linear structure. Instead, what you'll have is your other states, the other states who are also party to that international law, they may decide to just stop trading with you as a show of, um, of a means of um, disagreement with your action. But that's probably as far as it can go. If you think about it, and no, NATO is not an international police force, you can't just lock up a state you have to put in place measures that other states will be able to put in place because there's no one higher up to put measures in place to penalize the state for not adhering to international law. So when we look at it in that frame then, you do think to yourself, well, what exactly is the force of international? What's the power of international? Law? It doesn't seem to have any teeth. It does. If you have many states that adhere to international law, they adhere to their legal obligations, then what you tend to find is states will choose to adhere to those obligations and they will choose to continue to adhere to those obligations and will penalize other states that don't necessarily adhere to those obligations by not trading with them, for example. And that can be problematic for other states. States do rely on each other for trading purposes. So international law does have force, but the question is then, if we've got this linear structure and if everyone is equal and there is no higher authority and everyone chooses to adhere to their international law, what else can states do to show their neighbouring states who have signed international law that they have taken this seriously and they're going to be trickling it down into their domestic framework? Well, what they can do is they can build into their domestic framework legislation and policy that reflects those obligations. I know it's thrilling, isn't it? So <laughs> terrible joke, apologies for that. But if you're still with me and haven't fallen asleep just yet, when we think about international law and we think about those obligations that states will sign up to and they adhere to, in order to make sure that everyone in their state and also adheres to that, those international legal obligations, you have to put in place your domestic framework. Now, your domestic framework is made up of national law and policy. Now, let me give you another example. In most states, probably just about every state, there is a hierarchical vertical structure. For example, if you do something naughty, and let's say the police come along, here's you and here's the police, they come along, they'll arrest you, so they put you in prison. Okay, then you've got to go to court. So you've got to have your um, issue heard by a judge. The judge makes a decision. You might appeal that decision. You might go further up, further up. In any respect, what you do have is you have a government parliament here in New Zealand that makes legislation that we must adhere to. So it works in a vertical way. It trickles down. So we must abide by the law of New Zealand if we're resident here in New Zealand or living here and just taking New Zealand then as an example. We must abide by that in our everyday life because if we don't, we will be held to account by a higher authority. So in that way, it's vertical. Now, if you're a state and you want to show your other states who have signed up to some international law with you that we are going to be adhering to our obligations under international law by putting in place 
the vertical structure. We're going to be making legislation so that the people that reside in our country all adhere to this international obligation. Then you would do that through your domestic framework. And you do it through a means of national law policy. And as I said, I'm going to give an example of New Zealand. And what we're going to do is talk through how New Zealand has done this with space law. But just to take you back for a moment now, because I've turned you all into international lawyers, I need to turn you into international space lawyers. Now, in order to do that, there are some very special international legal treaties and conventions that apply specifically to activities in outer space. I'm so sorry, but time doesn't permit me to go through all of those treaties. But what I've done is I've taken just two for today for you to think about. The first one is the Outer Space Treaty 1967. The second one is the Liability Convention 1972. Okay, just a quick recap then. International lawyer hat on. What we have is a bunch of nation states, states they've got together, they've drafted up some legislation or international law, they've all signed it, it's horizontal in nature, we're all equal with each other, we will abide by our obligations under international law and the first one is the Outer Space Treaty. Now the Outer Space Treaty is quite general in nature, it deals with activities in space among other things. There's quite a few things that that treaty deals with and if at all you're really minded, do just do a Google search and have a look at the Outer Space Treaty 1967 and have a read through it. There's lots of things that are covered in there, but it's quite general in its nature. It was the first treaty to be negotiated and signed by many nation states in the 60s that dealt with space and space activities. So it's multilateral. That means many different parties and they all signed it. And that's why in of itself, it's quite a general document. However, as time progressed, nation states got together at the UN level and said, well, you know, we really need more, uh, just more international law in place to set out how we should, shouldn't be using space, how we can keep space for the benefit of mankind. So one of the other treaties that came about was in 72, and that's the Liability Convention. Who is at fault if something happens in outer space? Let's just say you've got an asset, a launch, and your payload is on board, you launch it into the sky, it blows up halfway. Or perhaps maybe something happens whilst it's in space. Or perhaps in the return journey, it comes back and causes damage on its way back in. Who is responsible for it? Because under international law, as you know, states are equal. And it is only states that can sign international legal instruments. So is it the state that is at fault? Well, yes, it is the state that's at fault then. So again, we go back to our domestic frameworks. How does the state pull in its obligations and pull in all of the things that it has to adhere to within its domestic framework to make sure at a vertical level that it is implementing control over various activities that are happening from its state. And that's where the power of the domestic framework is so important. If you have national law in place, you're going to have something that is seeking to outline to everyone within that state what they can and can't do. So if you have something that says, look, you can launch from New Zealand, but you need a permit. And if you launch without a permit, you're going to be in trouble. What will happen is then is that if you do something naughty and you do and you launch without a permit, you're probably going to have to answer for your actions. And again, that's that hierarchy in place. You have to answer for your actions. You're probably going to face a penalty of some sort and henceforth. So again, it's that vertical structure. It's put in place as a means of control in order to ensure that activities or anything else for that matter is kept safe and kept in line with that horizontal obligation that those nation states have together. So when states think about how they're going to implement their national law, there's all sorts of policy that comes into play. How does the state feel about its international relations with other states? What if, like New Zealand, that state is part of the Five Eyes partners? So New Zealand's part of a very special relationship with the US, Canada, UK, 
um, Australia and in of itself, New Zealand, we have five partners then and they have a very special relationship together and they share information. But if you're going to put in place some international law within your domestic framework, you sometimes do need to think about the type of activities that are going to be undertaken in this instance, space. And what do our partners, our five eyes, our close relation, international relations for that matter, our friends, our other states, what do they think about space activities? Then you might think further afield. What do other states think about activities? For example, Luxembourg, they've got a very, very fast moving space plan at the moment and space policy. It's there's lots of things to take into account when you're looking at an international level, when you're bringing in your domestic framework, but then you have to consider your internal, your domestic context as well. So for example, in New Zealand, we have quite strict health and safety laws. It's the Health and Safety at Work Act 2015, just by way of example. We've got other laws as well in place. Um, you've all heard of ACC, for example. So if there's an accident and you're injured as a result of that accident, ACC may very well cover you. So We've got lots of policy that we have to take into account. International policy that is governed by that international law horizontal structure. Then we've got our vertical structure of control and looking at both international relations and what's going on domestically. What kind of legislation do we have in place that can work with what it is we're trying to legislate for? And what is our current government, for example, thinking? What is their current posture on certain things? Does it affect the way that we're going to structure our domestic legislation? So lots of things to consider. Now, New Zealand undertook that exercise, as does many states when implementing domestic law, when implementing law that is applicable to their state. And part of its um, implementation is New Zealand would have thought about a few of those issues. But because space is so new and different for a New Zealand, it's the way that it thought about it may have been different from other nation states. Indeed, most states will think about extraterrestrial, excuse me, not extraterrestrial, but extra jurisdictional activities, in this instance, space, something that is happening outside of the state maybe even Antarctica if you wanted, or high seas even. And they would have thought about those international elements and they would have thought about those domestic elements. And then that, along with how the government is thinking about um, various policies and the way that New Zealand is going ahead on certain aspects, they would have thought about these things when implementing their domestic framework. So New Zealand does have a Space Act now in place and that came about in 2017. And Again, it's a combination of all of these really important matrix of our horizontal and vertical structure of international law and relations, as well as vertical domestic law and internal policy considerations. So look, without boring you any further, I would safe to, I would say to, safe to say that you're now not only international lawyers, but international space lawyers with a good understanding of New Zealand space law to the extent of how it works from an operational basis. Thank you so very much. Terribly sorry for speaking so fast, but looking forward to discussing a bit more with you guys during discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Maria. Um, it was really interesting. I personally don't know very much about space, well, law or space law, uh, that is. Um, and so, that was a very good ground, at least a brief introduction to what we are kind of trying to consider here. Um, so are there any questions for Maria? Uh, hi, I had a question. So um, when a, a leader from a state um, chooses to agree to a treaty, um, can a new leadership team choose to opt out of it? Are there yeah. any repercussions to do that? That's a brilliant question. What a great question. This happened under the Bush administration. Um, now, sometime in the 70s, the US and former Soviet Union got together and they signed up to something called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. When Bush came along, 2001, and I remember this date quite distinctly, was it 2001 or was it 2010? Anyway, 
dates are irrele irrelevant. But under the Bush administration, George Bush decided he did not want to be a party to that treaty any longer with the former Soviet Union, now Russia. And so the US announced to the world, we're moving out of that treaty and we no longer, we no longer wish to be a part of it. It was really interesting and it had international lawyers around the world scratching their heads. What does this mean? What do we do? So it's a really good point. The idea is, is that for consistency purposes, if you have a nation state or a head of state signs the document, the treaty, convention, whatever it is, irrespective of the fact if it is then drawn down into that vertical structure, irrespective if that has happened or not, the idea is, is that that is it. You've signed the international law, your state is now a party to that international obligation, to that treaty or convention, and it binds all future heads of states as well. Mm. But a great question. No worries. Thanks for that answer. Thank you. Oh, Maria, if I could ask something. Um, I, I was trying to remember where does the, what's the, where's the charter for the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, how did, I just don't remember how that, that came into being. Uh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's an elaborate process to um, evaluate radio frequency interference and, uh, and it's been, you know, well-established kind of protocol, uh, but it's, uh, there's a complete oversight in terms of not looking at optical interference, which is, you know, the issue with these astronomy observatories, but, uh, but is, there, is there a basis in, of a treaty or something, or I don't remember? Sure. So the ITU has its own charter in place, and you can find it on the website, on the ITU website. Now, the charter deals with radio allocations, as well as many other things, but something that's really interesting, and I think Eric is probably getting to just slightly there, is the fact that many people that wish to undertake activities in space tend to think that radio spectrum is available for everyone and they can just use any radio spectrum that isn't being used at the moment and that's not quite right in order to use a radio spectrum you have to go to the itu and register your usage for the i for that spectrum radio spectrum now, why we use radio spectrum is also critically important for our satellite support services. Now, Eric will know far more than me on the technical side of things. So I'm going to say this next bit with my disclaimer that I'm not a radio spectrum scientist. But in order to communicate with our satellites, we need to have a dedicated spectrum link so we can talk to our satellites and they can talk back to us. As scientists, you will know that satellites do actually fall out of orbit. I know it sounds ridiculous. I had to get my head around this, but they can fall out of orbit. As they orbit around the planet, they come closer and closer into the earth. And so sometimes they need correcting. Now you need a dedicated radio link to go up there in order to correct your satellite. Maybe you need to just like get the thrusters on for a couple of seconds just to push it back into its orbit. Okay, if you don't have a ded like dedicated link, then how on earth can you talk to your satellite and tell it what to do, such as push the thrusters up and just go back into your orbit, or perhaps even download or ascertain the information that the satellite is accruing. So you, it's really important to have that dedicated link. Now something, as our future scientists that I would all like you to think about, because it keeps me awake at night, is how do we protect that radio spectrum link. Because if you were a radio spectrum link hacker, cyber hacker if you like, you might try and implement, you might try and infiltrate that link in order to ascertain control of the satellite. What if you had a satellite already out there and you just maneuvered your satellite pretty close to that one and maybe you had some very smart cyber, cyber program 
that could infiltrate just by way of waves, I suppose. And again, Eric's going to know far more than me on this, but could infiltrate into that satellite's radio spectrum. And then you can ascertain control of it. I would like you all to think about how best we can protect our radio spectrum links specifically to our satellites, because that is going to really be the next big issue in space at the moment, especially when looking at security. So great question, Eric. Thank you. Megan, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, I've been notified that there's one more question, um, and then I think we should uh, transfer over to the other link and uh, have an idea for what we can do about the discussion that's a little bit different to what we discussed, okay. but since there are fewer people, um, I still think we can get what we want out of it, just in a little bit a different way. Cool. So. Uh, Hello, I have um, just one last question. Yes. Um, well, so thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. I find this stuff super fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, like, as a science student, like, is there space in space law for, you know, um, scientists to participate and contribute? Or I guess, to, you know, in a short way, like, how can I get into this sort of area? <laughs> That's a great question. Really fantastic. Now, there's two ways you can get in. One, as a scientist who specializes in space assets um, and does more of the work that Eric might do, for example. Eric is your best person to speak to in any event. He has a NASA background. Um, you can certainly join the United Nations Office of Outer Space. It's, it's UN... USA, so the Office of Outer Space Affairs. I always get the acronym, ac acronym wrong, but there's two committees there. One that deals with sci scientific aspects, so that's probably where you would be looking. The other is the legal committee. However, before you go and chat with Eric, let me try and pull you to the darker side, the darker side, and think about law and policy. We certainly need more people in New Zealand with a really strong scientific background who come into the legal side and the policy side of things. So if you wanted to get into space science, great, but your long-term plan should be to come over to the legal and policy side, because what we have is a lot of people like me, well, actually, I don't think we've got many people in New Zealand at all that deal with space law. I think I might be the only one. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But we have lots of people that think about space law and we have a lot of policy people that may be dealing with it, but they don't necessarily have, you know, a, a very wide specific space science background. And having someone that has a really good space science background who then comes into policy, not necessarily even into law, just policy for that matter, that is where we need some really great minds. So I'd like for you to think about that area. If I could also add oh. something. <laughs> Uh, okay. There's um, there's also a group, uh, an international called the Space Generation Advisory Council (SGAC), and uh, that's a that uh, that has representatives from 160 countries that advise um, uh, UN USA from a young person's perspective, um, and so they they uh, currently there's two uh, representatives in, that are in New Zealand. Uh, but they're always looking for more people to join. And, uh, and it's very interesting that, uh, I mean, they, they're, they, they actually have had, you know, big uh, on-site meetings uh, doing multi-day conferences in Vienna and advising the UN uh, Copius uh, office. And so uh, it's a good group. And, but also um, I remember from years ago, uh, I was sent by a, one of my tasks was to go into the um, reading room of the Federal Communications Commission and look at the satellite allocation uh, filings for uh, radio frequency for satellites. And uh, it was um, incredible to look at because it was an engineering document specifying, it's like reading the manual for how to build a computer, but it was all written in legal language. So it was like the most bizarre thing to, to read, you know, about whereas uh, 2.47 gigahertz and, you know, all this stuff. And, and it was just, um, and apparently my, my person I was working with said that 
um, those are the highest paid people in the world is the people that will deal with both engineering and the legal language. And, uh, uh, you know, this was 40 years ago, they were making a million dollars a year. And so I don't know what they're making now, but it's, it's, um, so it, it's just a, a, uh, the overlap between these different disciplines is very interesting and, uh, and very unique. Thank you both for your answers. That's super fascinating and it's given me a lot to think about. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, I would also like to thank you both. It's been a very interesting conversation. 